Okay, good evening everybody. And thanks thanks for being here. Where you'll see from your notes, um, don't be put off by the way, but we'll we'll run through a lot of that stuff very, very quickly. I tried to I tried to give you as much as I could on that, you know, so you'd have it there for your own reference and so on. Um, but welcome and thanks for being here. And just give me one moment until I get up and going here and uh, we'll take it from there. In fact, let's let's just uh, let's just have a word of prayer together before we before we start. Father, we praise, we thank you again this evening. We gather in your presence. Lord, we come once again around your word. And Lord, our prayer would be tonight that whilst we may not be, as it were, Lord, digging in particularly to any particular piece of scripture, <coughs> nonetheless, Lord, we pray that as we look at what we're are on the page before us this evening. As we look at those things, we pray that you will still, Lord, just build something into our lives and teach us and help us to see, Lord, your plan and your greatness and the fact that, Lord, we, we worship and we serve an absolutely glorious Savior and a God whose, whose kindness, whose grace, whose love is from everlasting unto everlasting. And tonight, Lord, we praise and we thank you that, Lord, you had a plan from before the foundation of the world. We thank you, our Lord Jesus Christ, fulfilled that plan. And, Lord, we praise and we bless you tonight that we gather here this evening because we're part of that plan. And, Lord, may every life be blessed this evening just as we look at these things that we're just going to look at tonight. Lord, we just commit it to you. We pray, Holy Spirit, lead us. We pray that you will guide us. And we ask, Lord, that you will just teach us and show us the great things of our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. So undertake, Lord, you know those who aren't with us tonight. We commit every single one of them to you. And we ask, Lord, let your blessing be upon them where they are tonight also. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. <coughs> Praise God. Now let me welcome you this evening in the Lord's name. And we do thank you for being here. And you'll see we're in the Gospel according to St. John, Session 15. John told me beforehand it seemed more like Session 30. So, <laughs> so there we are. Anyhow, um, if you look at your notes tonight, you'll see you have two full pages. I have eight screens on there. But as I said earlier, don't, don't worry about that because a lot of it is stuff that we will just simply be passing through. And I've tried to make them as comprehensive for you as possible. I haven't given you just everything, but there's a lot, a lot in that that you have uh, for your own study and so on after. Um, I want to change this evening out of the actual scripture as such. We've been digging in over the last chapter or two that we've been involved in and John. We've been digging into some of the scripture and then we've had debates and stuff like that after. And there'll be no debate. Well, there might be, but anyway, I'm only joking. Uh, that, that's, that's, all, that's all in good stuff, so it is. But tonight, I want to do something a little different because I said to you, I can't remember whether it was maybe three sessions ago or something like that. I told you that, that John's gospel, uh, another part of the structure of John's gospel, is that it's a journey through the tabernacle in the Old Testament. He writes his gospel like that, and it's evident, and it comes before us in that way. We've, we've looked at all our structural things. Um, you know, we've talked about the, the, the various miracles, specific miracles that he has chosen, the number of them the various I am statements and, and stuff like that. That's all part of the structure of the book. And tonight I want to go back into the structure for just a time and I want to take us for a little journey through uh, the tabernacle. And that's why I've got all the, all the tabernacle furniture and stuff here at the front and we will pass that around. There may be some of you here. We, we used all of this stuff down the street um, whenever we, uh, we did the By This Name, whenever we did that course through the book, which was the overview of the entire Bible. And we had all of this stuff there. I, I, I thought I would bring it out tonight. And if there's anybody here, obviously, we'll pass them around. And if there's anyone here who hasn't seen them, I'll give you some idea as to what we're talking about here whenever we think about the tabernacle itself. Now, the tabernacle had three parts. Let me, let me hold you up what I have of a tabernacle here this evening. That is basically the tabernacle. Can everybody see that all right? The tabernacle is, was basically, let me lift those away, that was just the, the top of the, 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 the holy, the sanctuary part was covered with various coverings, um, 
the inner, the inner covering would be the one. <coughs> let me just show that to you. The inner covering would have been the one like that, which was embroidered full of cherubim. That would have been on the inside. Uh, so whenever you were inside the sanctuary part and you looked up, you know, that's what you saw basically uh, as a covering or a, as the roof of that. But the tabernacle had, had three parts. Large oblong shape, okay, uh, and you had the outer court, which is the entire outer, and it's 100 cubits long by 50 cubits wide. And to keep that in good own imperial measurement, a cubit's roughly a foot and a half, okay? <laughs> so you're looking at 150 feet by 75 feet. Now, you haven't this in your notes, but uh, we mentioned this the time we did the course down the street, and if you read through the book of Exodus, and th let me say, by the way, the tabernacle in your scriptures occupies the largest part of scripture that any individual thing in scripture covers, other than the gospels of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the tabernacle is something that's very important because there's so much of it, so much space given to it there in the book of Exodus. How Moses received the pattern, how he was to make it according to the pattern and how they did all of that. And of course it became the central part of the presence of God in the life of the nation at that time. Um, you will find if you read back there, this would have been right in the very center of the camp. And you would have had three tribes encamped here, three here, three here, and three here. Twelve tribes right in the center. Now, remember the tribe of Levi are com completely uh, committed to the work of the tabernacle. So they wouldn't be amongst the tribes, you know, part out around the outside of it. But to take the place of Levi, of course, Joseph, okay, the two sons of Joseph, uh, they, Naphtali and, uh, not Naphtali, Ephraim, and what's the other name of Joseph's other son? Come on, come on. Manasseh, correct. So the two tribes would have taken the position of Joseph. So that still left 12 tribes. But this would have been the center of the camp. You'll find, um, you'll find at a time God actually, whenever he was displeased with the people because of what they had done, he made Moses take the tabernacle out of the camp and it was pitched right outside at one section in the Old Testament scriptures. Remember the camp, it's hard to know. They estimate two to three million people. And someone has estimated that whenever the camp actually camped down, it was 12 miles in diameter, or 12 miles in, in breadth and 12 miles in length. Like, you know, you have to accommodate all that number of people. But that's it there. Oblong shape, the outer court, okay, and then you had this part which was known as the sanctuary, and the sanctuary was 30 cubits by 10, which again, 45 feet by 15 feet, and it's split into two parts, the holy place and the holy of holies. 20 by 10, and the holy of holies would be 10 by 10, roughly 15 feet by 15 <coughs> feet. Whenever they made camp, the tabernacle would have been pitched and it was always pitched in an east-west direction. Always. And the entrance into the tabernacle was always at the eastern side. You always entered from the east. That was the way. That's all in the book of Exodus. You'll find all of that there. Now go leave that down and look, feel free. Just come up if you want to take a, a look at that afterwards. The sheep and stuff that's in there, they're just part of the model. So don't worry about that for the time being. But if you want to take a look at that afterwards, feel free. You can push that out your, out your way, okay? So that, that's, that's the situation. It was, always, it was always pitched, as I say, east-west, and you entered it from the eastern side. Whenever you come into the outer court, the first entrance was known as the gate. You went on through the outer court, and whenever you got to the sanctuary, that was called the door into the sanctuary, and then... That was the, holy, the holy, of, holy place, and between the holy place and the holy of holies, that was known as the veil. Remember, the veil in the temple was rent in twain. That was the veil between the holy and the holy of holies. So that, that's, that's basically the picture of, of the tabernacle that we have there. Let me just move that on for just a moment or two. Now, let's, let's journey through the tabernacle for just a moment or two, because what we're going to do is we're going to journey through it, and then we're going to highlight how John journeys through it in his gospel. We're not going to elaborate on anything. I'm just going to give you the references and show you how the whole thing sort of fits together in, in that way. But you will find that in the, in the tabernacle itself, 
there were seven very significant objects, pieces of furniture, if you like to call them that, in the entire tabernacle. And so whenever you enter the gate and you come into the outer court area of the tabernacle, the first thing that you'd have come to was something that looked a bit like this, which they called the brazen altar. Now I'm going to pass this round, okay? And I'm going to take those out. Those were the staves that enabled them to carry it from one place to the other. And, and that's basically it there. It was where the sacrifice would have been made. Can you pass that around? <coughs> now, I've counted them. There's seven pieces, and they're all going to come back up here. <laughs> okay. If you've seen them before, don't worry about that. I've taken the staves out, by the way, there to save you having to worry about those. Okay, so you have the brazen altar of sacrifice. That would have been the first thing that you would have encountered in the outer, uh, the outer court. Whenever you went past that, are you okay there, everybody? All right, just, just take a look and, and pass it on and so on. I don't want to leave anybody behind in this. If you haven't seen it before, just feel free to, to take a, a browse through it there and see. Don't worry about the foam rubber in it. I forgot to take that out of it. That, <laughs> <laughs> that shouldn't be in there. Okay. <laughs> All right, so that would have been the altar, okay? The brazen altar of sacrifice. Whenever you went past that, the next thing that you came to was the brazen laver for cleansing, okay? And the brazen laver w would have looked something like that. Stood in some kind of a stand. The scripture doesn't tell you what size the laver was. And I don't know why, I can't give you an answer to that. But, you know, it can tell you stuff about the other furniture, but the labor, it doesn't tell you what. I have my own thoughts on that, but I'll keep them to myself um, because they are, <laughs> they are my own and they're not worth worrying about. But that, that, was, that was the brazen labor. That was the next thing that you came to. Was that for the washing of hands? That was for washing of hands. It was indeed. Mm -hmm. And that was in the outer court as well. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on some of the things that they were for. You know, I'll come back to all of that in a moment or two. I just want to... <laughs> Get them passed around and let you see what they are. Anywhere at all, Alistair. I leave it. That's okay. Thank you. Okay, so that's the brazen laver, and that was for, for cleansing. And that's the outer court. Now, you, you, you go past those things, and you come then to the sanctuary part of the tabernacle, okay? And passing through the door of the sanctuary into the holy place, the first thing that you would have come across was the table of showbread. And the table of showbread was on your right-hand side whenever you went in to the, the holy place. And that would have been the north side. Remember, we're pitched east-west. So that would have been the north side. And the table of showbread would have looked something like that. Okay. And, of course, there were staves that were put through that through rings on the side, which enabled them, if I can get them in, which enabled them to move it and carry it from one place to the other. And, of course, the showbread, I was saying to some people earlier, the paint's coming off those, and some people said, were they brown or white bread? I said, they look a bit blue moldy to me. But <laughs> anyway, and, and the showbread would have sat on there. You can, you can pass that round <coughs> as well. Okay. I've kept the showbread. Don't, don't want anybody to get food poisoned. <laughs> okay. So you had the table of showbread on the right-hand side, and there would have been, you know, bread and stuff on there. Will you, will you go to Exodus 25 with me for just a moment? I've got a couple of references here. Let's, let's just pick up on these for a moment or two. Exodus chapter 25. Let's read verses 29 to 30. Now, in this section, he's given the whole design here of the table uh, for the showbread and that. But verse 29 says, And thou shalt make the dishes thereof, and spoons thereof, and covers thereof, and bowls thereof, to cover with all of pure gold shalt thou make them. And thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me always. Okay? So there would always have been bread on that table. Go to, go to Leviticus chapter 24. 
You haven't very many scriptures to look up this evening. <coughs> Leviticus chapter 24, that's verse 9. Verse 9 it says, And it shall be Aaron's and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place, for it is most holy unto him of the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute. So the showbread that would have been on that table, uh, you can read, you know, you can read more there on your own. That would have been part of the priest's food, those who ministered in, in the tabernacle. Okay, now I've said to you that was on, that was on the, the, the right side, which would have been the north side of the holy place. Opposite that, okay, whenever you're in there on, on the left side, which would be the south side, stood the seven-thonged seven golden, I don't know where to call it, a candelabra or a candelabrum. Okay, that's your Latin. Um is a singular, ah is a plural. Okay, so candelabrum, that, the menorah as we know it. That would have been on the left side whenever you enter the holy place. And by the way, um, the Christian, not the Christian Institute, I beg your pardon, the, the Temple Institute in Israel, um, they have made a replica of the menorah. And one of the times that we were in Jerusalem, it stands in a big, a big glass cabinet of a thing that you're able to go past. And look, it probably stands about that height. They reckon that was the height of it, the scale of it. David, David, you see, if you understand the Temple Institute in Israel, what they are actually trying to do, their plan would be that eventually they will get the Temple Mount back, the dome on the rock will go, they will rebuild a temple, and so they're in the process of making all of the implements that are needed for the temple. So the menorah, they have it made, they have it on display, and, and I'm not joking, it's, it's a massive thing with the seven with the seven heads going up out of it and so on. Okay, so that's uh, the menorah. The, and, and the menorah, the menorah represents, you know, the sevenfold Holy Spirit. The Bible in another place talks about the seven spirits of God. And it's a symbolic thing. It speaks of the, the total presence and the power of the Spirit of Almighty God. And the menorah burned with the seven different branches there. Christ is the light of the menorah, that's what it represents, and the oil that feeds that light in the menorah is a type of the Holy Spirit. The oil, of course, we know, signifies the Holy Spirit. So that's the purpose, really, of, of the menorah. Um, let me move that one on, on to the next one. Then also standing in the holy place, and standing more or less in front of the veil that took you into the holy of holies, is the golden altar of incense. And it was a tall piece of furniture, something like that. And again, you know, rings and stuff on the side of it. The stairs went through it to be able to, to move it from one place to the other whenever they journeyed. But it, it was something like that. And it was also in the holy place. Okay. Now that speaks, the altar of incense speaks typically of Christ as our intercessor. That's what it really signifies or speaks of. And it's not just Christ as our intercessor, but it's also Christ as the intercessor of the believer's priest's prayers. Okay? The believer's priest's prayers. And they are made fragrant. You see, the idea of the incense is that the prayers, the prayers of the intercessors are, are, are made you know, they're made fragrant by that incense that was burned. And it represented the all-perfect merits of the precious name in which that person prays, which is the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the incense adds the fragrance, so to speak, of the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to, the, to our prayer. Okay, so that's what we find in the, the holy place. And then moving on through that, you know, you come to the veil... And the veil, of course, is the entrance into the Holy of Holies. And you find in the Holy of Holies, you had what we called, and what is called, the Ark of the Covenant. 
Now the Ark of the Covenant was again uh, made out of acacia wood. It was fully, fully covered with, with gold plate. Uh, again, you were given certain dimensions. The Ark of the Covenant would actually have been something like, uh, I've written down here, three feet nine, I've given this an imperial, three feet nine inches long, okay, by roughly about two foot three inches wide. That's an approximate measurement there, okay? And it was the same height as it was breadthwise. And so that was that, and you would find it inside it, I'm going to pass this round, inside it you had the tables of the law, Okay, you have two of them in there. You also had a golden pot of manna in there. And as well as that, you had Aaron, the high priest rod. Remember the rod that budded whenever God proved that he, he, was the, he was the man that God had chosen. So those were kept in the Ark of the Covenant. And it sat in the Holy of Holies. No, 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 no. <laughs> this is common this is common tight behind it so <laughs> you're jumping way ahead of me you're going to get me into trouble here <laughs> okay so that was the Ark of the Covenant okay now let me say something that typifies Christ that Ark it typifies Christ as the all perfect ground and centre of the covenant relationship with God and I'll come back to that in a moment. But that's what that represents. He's the ground for it, and he's the center of the covenant relationship, our covenant relationship with God. And then, the seventh piece of furniture that I wanted to keep separate to highlight for you was exactly the lid of the ark. And it's known as the mercy seat. The mercy seat. Now, the mercy seat is the same size as the ark. It just simply sits on the top of it. It's the lid. The mercy, solid gold. No wood, solid gold, complete gold. And it's overarched, you'll see here, it's overarched by, by cherubim with outstretched wings. They're facing inwards. They're looking downwards upon the mercy seat. The mercy seat is here in between the two. And the cherubim, they're outstretched. They're looking over it. And it's the same dimension, and this was made out of pure gold. And whenever this was set into the Holy of Holies, the throne, the mercy seat, the lint side, the long side, was facing the entrance. So you looked at it like that whenever you're into it. Now you can pass it on now, Steve. <laughs> and that just simply, that's the mercy seat which sits on top of it. The mercy seat, by the way, just while that's going round and you're looking at that, can I say that the mercy seat typified the throne of God? That's what it actually was. It, it, it was the type of the throne of God. And you see, here's the thing about the mercy seat on the top of the Ark of the Covenant. It was the throne of God, but it was a throne of grace, not a throne of judgment. It was a not a judgment seat, it was a throne of grace. And that was done, and that was due, should I say, to the blood of sprinkling that was taken in and sprinkled upon the mercy seat on the Day of Atonement for the nation. The blood was sprinkled, and whilst it was replica of the throne of God, it was a, 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 you know, a seat of mercy where, where the sinner could receive forgiveness, where their sins were dealt with, and the blood would have been sprinkled there upon the mercy seat. Okay, now that's all of the furniture. That's all of the seven things that you have there in, uh, in the, 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 the tabernacle as we're talking about here. Now, they are all types of Christ. <coughs> they all speak and point to Christ, and they all speak of what was to come because of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me just move that screen on there for a moment. Let me finish by saying this. We haven't just left the tabernacle yet. Because in the Holy of Holies, there was also the Shekinah, the glory of God. And you've looked at the mercy seat. The Shekinah, it's hard to explain, um, and nobody probably really can explain it. But the Shekinah was an, an indefinable, unearthly light, which glowed just above the mercy seat below the wings of the cherubim. It was like a glowing light that sat in there. Okay, that's what it was. And, and the Shekinah, 
it, it was more like a symbol. That, that was, sorry, I beg your pardon, it was more than a symbol because that glory gleam, if you like to call it that, was actually a visible form of the divine presence. Now, how you work that out, I don't know. You know, how God's God and somehow here's a divine form of his presence. But that's what the Shekinah represented. That's what it was. The divine presence of God. And that hallowed the Holy of Holies and the ark and the mercy seat which was in there. That's why no one could go in there except the high priest. And we know, you know, we know the stories. He went in with the blood of atonement once a year. But the, the Shekinah glory, the Shekinah flame, the, gl the glow, if you like, it was something of the presence of Almighty God amongst his people. Now, let me go through all of those again for just a moment. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight what each one of them was in their day and then how each one of them is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have the brazen altar, okay, in the outer court. And the brazen altar was a place of sacrifice that was atonement through sacrifice. And of course, in the New Testament, the atonement of Christ. You then have the brazen laver, the washing laver. And, and, and that actually stood for, for spiritual renewal. It stood for regeneration by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Being regenerated by the Holy Spirit. I've just, that's why I've said, I've given you all of this, you know, quite full. Number three, you come into the holy place. You come to the table of showbread. And that speaks of, spiritual sustenance the bread was there the the priests would have you know would have would have eaten that during ministry and stuff like that and of course that typified christ the living bread for his people then you had the menorah let me move that one on you have the menorah or the golden candlestick there that we, we passed around as well and the menorah represented spiritual illumination typical of christ the light especially for his own people. Okay? Number five, the altar of incense. That was acceptable supplication. That's what it represented. Prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've given you a couple of references there. We need to look them up. But you know that whole section in John 14 where he's talking to his disciples and he's talking to them about prayer and so on. You know, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name and stuff like that. that. That all comes into play there. And again, Revelations 5 verse 8 mentions something similar to that. You come into the Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant is access through covenant relationship. That's what the Ark symbolizes. And Christ is our covenant access. He's the one that gives us the right. You see, in the Ark, in the Ark you see there you have the, the tablets, you have the law, you have the manna, and you have the, the high priest's rod, Aaron's rod, which, which budded. And you see, the thing about the law in the Ark of the Covenant is everybody has broken the law except Christ. So Christ fulfilled the law. Christ is the bread sent down from heaven in the manna. And Christ is our great high priest represented by the, the high priest's rod, Aaron's rod, which budded. And so that's our access, a law that has been kept completely. And someone sent by God in that position to intercede and to act as high priest, the mediator between God and man. And that's our access through that covenant relationship. And Christ is our covenant access. And then the mercy seat, finally, that's acceptance at the throne of God. And it's acceptance with God in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what's typical of all. That's what they all typify. And that's what they speak to. Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 25. <coughs> just, just a quick reference to that. Romans chapter 3, verse 25. You see, we're accepted with God in Christ. In fact, let's read from verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood 
to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. So we're accepted completely by God in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because he has set them forth for that very purpose. And that's what all of those things typify, and that's what all of them uh, speak to us of. Everybody happy with that? You okay? Anybody want to say anything or ask anything? or Okay. I know, the listen. I beg your pardon? The labor, just water in the, the labor, yeah, just, just for being water. It was, it, the, the priests and so on actually would have cleansed, you know, they would have washed in that, yeah, before, before they went into the holy place. You see, bear in mind, maybe, maybe, you know, involved with some kind of sacrifice and before they could do anything else, you know, it was, it was a washing and cleansing thing. But it speaks to us, you know, of, of, of washing from sin and so on, you see. So anyway, uh, that, that, that's where we are with that. Let, let me bring you now into the gospel for just a moment. And this will only take us a few moments and then really we're finished. I, th- I, thought, I, th- I thought we would do this tonight and I thought it would be slightly different. And yet I think it's something that's well worth reflecting upon and thinking about in the gospel. Whenever you come across again then into John's gospel, remember, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Let me say this. The true order of approach to God has never changed. The true order of approach to God is exactly the same under the new covenant that we stand in today as it was in the old covenant. The difference being that we do it all through the Lord Jesus Christ. But the entrance to God's presence is exactly the same. Okay, so John leads us in his gospel. He leads us in exactly the same order as those seven items of furniture that you find in the tabernacle. And he leads us, John leads us through these things to portray to us the great spiritual realities that they typify by their prominence there in the tabernacle in the Old Testament. And so I've given them to you here. You have the brazen altar of sacrifice, chapter 1. And you'll find twice in that chapter you have the phrase, Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The brazen altar where the sacrifice of atonement would be made. You come across the gospel, you come into chapter 3 of the gospel. And he's speaking to Nicodemus, okay? And remember I said that the labor, it speaks of of cleansing and it speaks of renewal. And so Jesus in chapter 3 of John's gospel speaks to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And he says, except someone is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so John, you know, that's the second item, the second piece of furniture that John has just taken us past in chapter 3. Then you have a section of three chapters, chapter 4 right through to chapter 6, and there he takes us to the table of showbread with its food and with its drink. Remember the woman at the well? If anyone drinks of the water that I give them, they will never thirst again. And we, we spent a couple of weeks then on the feeding of the 5,000 and the fact that he's the living bread sent down from heaven. You know, and so of which if a man eat, you know, he shall live forever. And so John now has taken us past the table of showbread. He's our food. He's our drink. He's everything that we need for life and for sustaining life and so on. In fact, we highlighted the fact in chapter 6 that he doesn't just sustain life. He's the giver of life as well as a sustainer. John, you move on past the gospel. We haven't got this length yet. I have no idea why we haven't got this length yet because we are in session 15. (laughs) But anyway, um, you come into chapters 8 and 9 of the gospel and chapters 8 and 9 bring us uh, to the golden candlestick. They bring us to the menorah. Okay. And twice in those chapters we hear the Lord say, I am the light of the world. And on one occasion he says, he that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And so now he has taken us, he has taken us to to gaze upon the menorah. And then, you know, in that section, you have the man who's born blind, born blind, and he's given illumination because Jesus gives him his sight. See, the whole thing all completely ties in together. You move on across, you come to chapter 14, and you have this whole whole section in chapter 14 where Jesus is with his disciples, and he's talking to the disciples that long, that, that I, I just love that discourse that he has 
with the 11 disciples there. And, and by that stage, we are now at the golden altar of incense. And he teaches them and he talks to them about praying and all of that stuff that they need to know. And, and he, he's, he's showing them how to pray in a way and by a name, his name, that up until this point has never been used or known before. Learning, teaching them that they might learn how to offer prayers in the name of Jesus. Prayers that became as fragrant incense when perfumed by the breathing of the name of Jesus, which above all other names is dear to the heart of Almighty God, rising as a sweet smelling savour and a sweet smelling incense. The altar of incense. And then you have a little interlude. And you step into chapter 17. And you'll know chapter 17 is that high priestly prayer that we are allowed the privilege, that intercessory prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ, which we are allowed to, to overhear, if you like, as it falls from the lips of our great high priest as he reaches out to his heavenly Father. And as we look at that, we are taken through the veil, as it were, in John's Gospel, into the very holy of holies. And we are permitted a glimpse into the high priestly ministry of intercession, which he exercises for us in the presence of God. That's what chapter 17 is all about. And then finally, after you get past chapter 17, you come into chapter 18 and 19, and that's the heart-subduing climax of Calvary. Chapters 18 and 19. How he is also the very Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat that is sprinkled with the blood by his own vicarious self-offering and sacrifice that's made for us. And John walks us through the tabernacle, highlighting every single piece of furniture that's there in the outline of his gospel. Had you ever seen that before? That's not mine, by the way. <laughs> let, me, let me make that very, very clear. You know, but that, that's, that's one way. You see, I said to you way back, right at the beginning, there are many ways that you can walk your way through this gospel. You, know, you can pick up on any of the structural forms. I, I have tried to throw in you know, different things about structure in this gospel, but you could, you could pick up any one of those structures and you could search and work your way through the gospel on that structure only. I've tried to embrace a number of things to give you just a, an overview of, of just how well put together this gospel really. I mean, obviously the Holy Spirit put it together, but it's, I, f I find it's just an astounding book as far as the Word of God is concerned. It's just so full of types and it's so full of, of, of as I say, structure that's so meaningful as far as the rest of the Word of God is concerned. You see, I, I class John's gospel as, as, as the climax of the gospels. I love Matthew, I love Mark, I love Luke, but I think John's gospel, there's just something so dynamic about it. And I've tried to, I've tried to pull in lots of different kinds of structures for you to, to let you see just, but you can follow it, as I say, you can follow through the gospel on any one of those structures. But we've come to chapter 18 and 19, the ark and the mercy seat. He is a covenant and he sprinkles the mercy seat with his own blood. Let me finish. And you're going to sigh and say, boy, this is early tonight. Huh? But there you are. So we're giving you an early night. You come to chapter 20 of the gospel. And you'll know that chapter 20, flick over there. We're going to read a couple of verses. John chapter 20. I'm going to read them in a moment or two. Chapter 20 is the chapter that comes after chapter 19. <laughs> I couldn't resist saying that there. Okay. Chapter 20 comes after crucifixion. Chapter 20 is the chapter of resurrection. And in that chapter, at once our risen Lord announces our new covenant relationship with God. I think it's amazing. I think it's amazing. You see, I've given you a reference there. Look at verse 17 of chapter 20. In fact, let's, lead, let's read back a wee bit. Let's read back a wee bit. Verse, verse 11. But Mary stood without at the sepulchre weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and she looked into the sepulchre. And she sees two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. 
And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus said unto her, Woman, why do you weep? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said unto her, Mary. And she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and to your God. Now let's, let's just, just stop. That's the verse that I want to highlight. But let's stop there for a moment or two. She recognizes him and he says to her, don't touch me. You see, he has to go and present himself to the father. He doesn't want touched by humanity. He is risen from the dead. He's the sacrifice that you know that was made, the blood that was shed. He died. He is risen again, and he has to present himself to the Father. Now, where that is, we don't know. Is it in the realm somewhere of the spiritual? Where you know, we, we're not told. The Bible doesn't doesn't go into those kind of details. You see, he tells her not to touch him, but further along the chapter, he appears to the eleven and he tells them they can touch him. So something has happened between her meeting him here, and whenever he goes to be with them. You understand what I'm saying? So he, he has to present himself. That's what he says here. I have not yet ascended unto my Father. So he's going to present the fact that here is the finished work. He has shed his blood. He has died. He has risen again. And he is ascending to the Father to present the finished work back to him who had given him the, the task and the work to do in the first place. But he immediately here, even at this stage, he announces to Mary this new covenant relationship with God. Because look again at, at, at the verse. Look at verse 17. I am not yet ascended by... Go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father. And to who? Your father. Up until this time... Right through the gospel, he has talked about, I do what the Father tells me to do. I say what the Father tells me to say. You know, I express what I see the Father doing. And the work that the Father does is my work. All of those things that we've looked at. But now he's enlarged that. And he's now going to his Father and he's saying to her, to your Father. He immediately announces our covenant relationship with God because of the finished work that he has carried out. And he says, I ascend to my Father, to your Father, to my God, and to your God. And the covenant's changed. Immediately the new covenant is announced and the relationship that that covenant brings. You see, in the Old Testament, all through the tabernacle, sins, the blood was sprinkled, sin was only covered. But thank God, and we know this, thank God in our Lord Jesus Christ, sin is dealt with completely and praise God, it's gone. The veil is rent in two. We have access right into the Father's presence because sin through our Lord Jesus Christ has been completely eliminated in the life of the believer because we stand complete in Christ. And so we can call him our Father and we can call him our God. Where Jesus called him his Father and his God, we now have the privilege of the same relationship in Christ as Christ himself had with the Father. That makes sense, yes? Okay. So John, John has traveled right through this tabernacle with us, and he brings us to this new covenant that Christ has made available. Okay, seven objects. I'm going to throw in a wee thing here, and maybe I'm stretching this, and I hope I'm not. But he has taken us through seven objects, and through those seven objects, he finally discloses the reality which you know, corresponds with the holy Shekinah glory. Remember, the Shekinah said seven pieces of furniture, but the Shekinah glory was after that. It's like number eight 
you understand what I'm trying to say? Remember the octave. Remember I said that the, the, the gospel, this gospel is full of octaves. You have seven notes, and the next thing after that that John highlights is one octave higher than where he began. It's on a higher pitch. It's on a higher plane. And so John in the gospel, he has taken us through the tabernacle of the old covenant, through those seven notes, if you like. He has shown us how Jesus fulfills all of those notes. Okay, and Jesus, now John tells us he appears in the room in this same chapter and he appears with his, his disciples. Okay, let's read verses 21 and 22. He comes now to his disciples and he says unto them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now he appears in the room and he has this calming, strengthening, tranquilizing greeting, if you want to call it that. Peace be unto you. He has his wounds. He has the marks of what he has been through. And he speaks reassuring words to them. And before he disappears, he does something and he says something so significant. Here, he breathes on them and he says, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. And you see, it's like traveling the full octave. Because now the Shekinah which sat upon the mercy seat, comes into the life of the believer by the Holy Spirit. And now the Shekinah has become the Christian believer's experience because the presence of God comes to dwell within the believer because of this new covenant. And he speaks this into their lives and he breathes upon them, receive you the Holy Spirit. And we come in as you think about the tabernacle, we come in from the world in sin. We travel past the seven notes of the octave and we get to number eight at the other end, the Shekinah, and we leave again, having been in his presence, and we carry back out into the world, not our sin, but praise God, the very Shekinah, the presence of Almighty God, because the Spirit has come to dwell within the life of the believer. And that's how John presents it to us. And that's how it ties up with the tabernacle. And that's all I have to say. We're, we're finished. We've done all right, haven't we? But, you know, I, I trust it's a blessing to you as you think about that and as you look at it. And, you know, it carries us right through. He fulfills the whole thing. And it brings the believer into a place of tremendous privilege, doesn't it? Like Tremendous privilege. Where the high priest, you know, we, we often think, and we know that the high priest could only go in with the blood at that particular time of the year. And remember, of course, there was a time whenever the Shekinah left. But think for a moment about the high priest before that. You know, you think of Aaron being able to go in just on that set occasion each year and he could see the Shekinah glory in there. And now today... You and I, the veil is rent in twain, and we are not excluded except at certain times. But we have full access, we have free access, we have access at all times into the presence of God. And it's not just to look upon the Shekinah, but praise God, it's to carry it in our hearts. It's to carry it in our lives. And it's to be something of the presence and the significance of God back out into the world that we came from with all of our sin. And praise God, we leave cleansed. We leave in right relationship with him. And we carry his glorious and wonderful presence with us, no matter where we go. And we can call upon him at any given time. And may God just bless that thought, those things, to our hearts and lives this evening for his name's sake.